All right, you guys ready to get to it? Great, because this sermon was about two and a half hours, and then I kind of cut it a little bit, and um, I actually was thinking about doing like half in the first service and half in the second, and just be like, listen to the half you don't get. And, um, but let's try, to, let's try to focus in and get, get there. Um, I'm not going to have you open to a particular passage this morning because I'm going to be working through a bunch of them. So what I would suggest is take out a little piece of paper and write down some of these passages, and I'll give you devotional content for the whole week um, for your time with the Lord. We're doing a series right now called um, Unbrandable, which is rooted in the concept of this, that a, a good brand is a simple, direct promise that is made to people on the basis of what you're going to do for them that is rooted in their tastes and desires, and that God isn't really brandable because there are ways in which God defies reduction. He will not be simplified to the very simple categories that we want for consumer-based relationships. He wants to expand us to wisdom rather than narrow himself. Does that make sense? And then secondly, he's not going to accommodate himself to our tastes. He's not going to do that. He's going to actually heal our tastes and help us help transform our desires so that we desire what is good and what is in him so that he can give us himself. Does that make sense? And so he is unbrandable. And there's a number of ways in which this is true. Some of the most fundamental things about God are just unbrandable. They're not going to fit our natural and worldly tastes, and they're not simplifiable enough so that we can be like, oh, it's this, that we can throw out some little axiom like, well, God is love, so everything's okay, or God is this, or God is on my team, or whatever. Does that make sense? All right, now, this morning, we're going to focus on this a, a, a concept, which is that God's glory is shrouded. And it's hard to brand shrouded glory. Shrouded glory doesn't brand. People want glory, and they want that glory to be for them. So they want God to be glorious. They want God to win. They want God to have power. They want God to be amazing, and they want us to have power, us to have glory, us to be amazing. And so the question is, if God really is glorious, how should he treat himself, his friends, and even his enemies? Look, how should he do that? Right, one of the ways to think about this first is to recognize that all through the Bible, God explicitly claims to be glorious. Right? The book of Isaiah, one of the longest books in the Bible, starts out like this. In chapter 6, when in the call, for his, Isaiah's call, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on his throne, high and exalted. The train of his robe filled the temple, and above him were seraphs, those are, that is, angels. Then they had six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and they were flying, and they called out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. It's also true that God reveals himself as jealous of his glory, that he cares what's done with his glory. He's not indifferent about it. For example, in Isaiah 42, 5 to 9, it says this, this is, what the, this is what God, the Lord, Yahweh, says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its peoples and life to those who walk in it, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open the eyes that are blind, to free the captives from prison, to release from the dungeons those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place, taken place, and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. So in all these ways, God's saying he's, he's glorious, he's righteous, he's doing new things. You'll notice that what he says he does for the poor and for the weak and for the enslaved and for the imprisoned, he does through his Christ, because that is the exact verse that Jesus applies to himself as the one who's come to do that work. And he says that in that, even in giving his Christ and in all those things, even in helping the poor and the weak, he's doing it because he will not give his glory to another or his praise to idols. So he's glorious. The whole earth is filled with his glory. He is jealous about his glory. That is, that he, he believes it should be appropriately appropriated. He should be known for who he is. And that which he has done, which is good, should not be given to some other idol. The main reason being because the idols are wicked. And they will associate his glories in creation and redemption with wickedness that they will ensnare us with and cause us to do in the name of God's glory. That his glory will be misused to make us devils. And he will not allow that. Right? So then, how should he behave? right? I think most human beings would say the way he should behave, if he's really this incredibly glorious God, and that's really what he wants, he's jealously protective of his glory. What he should do is he should show his power and presence in a clear and consistent and commanding and obvious and self-interpreting and indisputable way. That's what he should do. He should leave no doubt in anyone's mind, in all of earth, among all generations, that he is exactly who he is. 
He should appear over every building at 3 p.m. and say, I am the Lord, the King over all of creation. And he should just like maybe read from Isaiah 42 if he wants to or make up his own thing, whatever. But just to make sure everybody knows every day, all the time, in every way that he is the glorious King of creation. Right? And here's the thing. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. He doesn't play that brand. God's glory is in some meaningful ways shrouded. And that bothers us. We think that the branding that God should have is something like, you're going to get sick of winning. Or, hey, God, come over to the winning side. Or, Jesus is going to make your life fantastic. Or, victory and blessing, as far as the eye can see. Like, that's like, it's like, that's what should be on all the church signs. And that's what God should be doing. Like, that should be God's brand, right? Because then everybody would believe in him and everybody would follow him and everybody would be happy. And we'd all have live in a wonderful world. And, and, and a lot of us don't believe we really want that, but we do. Right? The, the part of us that is under the curse, the part of us that doesn't understand what God is doing, the part of us that is worldly, the part of us that really feels like we know better than God, and, and there's, that's a big part of us. Um, that part of us wants God to brand himself that way. Right? If you're not a Christian, you're like, look, if God is there, he should be more obvious. It should be easier to believe in him. Why doesn't he do that? Right? And if you're not a Christian, or if you are a Christian, you're like, listen, it would be a whole lot easier for me. It'd be a whole lot easier to tell people about you if you would just brand yourself a little bit better. And you could see this in people's disappointment with God, how they deal with the fact that God should be branded this way. When you talk to a lot of irreligious people about why they don't believe, they'll just be like, look, if God really wanted people to believe in him, he'd make himself a lot more obvious. Right? What I see around me is a hidden God and a lot of suffering in the world. And what you tell me exists is a, is a God that is glorious and full of love. And if God really wanted me to believe in him, it wouldn't be this confusing, right? You, you, you see that a lot with, with folks who are irreligious. With people who are um, religious believers, but they're kind of discouraged in their faith, oftentimes you get this sense like, listen, God could really reveal himself more, especially when pain and discouragement hit. Because honestly, like there, when, when there's a lot of pain and I need to feel like I know God is there and doing something meaningful is when he sort of seems most, most far. And, and some people are like, well, God speaks to me. He speaks to me in my heart. It's so nice. And like, that's great. And I honestly, I believe that. I think the Bible teaches that God does speak to our inner person. But the thing is, is that like, there's a lot of voices of crazy inside most people, and that voice doesn't always sound that different. You know what I mean? And we don't, you don't always know for sure that was God's voice, even when it was God's voice, or sometimes maybe it wasn't God's voice. And that's not as definite and self-interpreting and obvious and in-your-face and powerful and bright as we want in those moments of darkness, right? Now, there's some Christians who would say, Nick, that's actually not right. He, actually, God, God like does brand himself that way. Like, God is glorious, and he's completely displayed it. And the reason why we don't see it is because we just don't, we won't believe. But for anybody who believes, God utterly displays his glory. There's, there's three versions of this that, I mean, this is—all these things are oversimplifications because this is about a 16-hour subject, okay? Um, but there's maybe three maybe misguided versions of this where people believe that God does brand himself in complete display of his glory. The first you could call it dominionism, which is the idea that— You've heard people quote the verse from the Old Testament that if um, people called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will hear their cry and I'll heal their land, right? And so there's people who feel like, listen, if we would all, all, if Christians would just be Christians, if we would just believe in God, right, and honor God, he would hear our cry and he would heal America back to a Christian Shangri-La of where people love Jesus everywhere. And, and, and it'll like, we'll have Christian laws and we'll have Christian coffee and we'll have, all, it'll be so Christian and, and godly and it'll be wonderful and God will have dominion over things and we will live under the beautiful reign of Christ, right? And like, all three of these are like kind of half true. Like there are ways in which if, Christians lived like Christians in profoundly beautiful ways, many people would concede a certain amount of leadership to them, and cultures could turn in godly directions in ways that were highly beneficial and not subjugating of people who weren't believers, and it would be a really beautiful thing, right? But the idea that if we all followed Jesus entirely, we wouldn't get eaten by lions and coliseums is just not true. God's own Christ couldn't turn around the Jewish culture. Right? Secondly is, is, is um, prosperity gospel, that if you give to God, God will give to you. Right? If you tithe, if you give 10% of everything you have, God is going to give you 10% of what he's got. Like, he's going to gi give you, it literally says in, in Luke's gospel, that if you give to God, God will give back to you a greater portion, shaken, packed down, stuffed in, 
right? And sometimes people feel like that's true money to money. And so if you give generously to God, God's going to give generously to you and show his glory by giving you victory, wealth, and success. And again, this is one of those deals that's like, it's, it's half true. In a shrouded way, God always does repay that which is sacrificed and given to him in worship, always. And that includes money. That includes money. Like, like I believe if you give the church a $1 gift or a $1 million gift, God will bless you. But not with a million, two, ten million dollars or fifty thousand dollars. Like it, it doesn't really work that way. God puts a shroud between your sacrifice and his giving of blessing. He always does that because, well, we'll get to why in a minute. <laughs> right? And then the third thing is faith healing. The belief that if you believe, if you really believe, God will heal you. And it doesn't matter what your problem is, what your sickness is, how old you are, how bad your back is. Like if you really believe, God will heal you. The healing's there. God is displaying himself in glory. He's promised it. He's given it. It's there for everybody all the time. And if you believe enough, you can be healed right now. Which is, again, it's half true. Jesus healed an enormous amount of people from things that could not be healed from, like being dead, for example. And he said that when he ascended into heaven and he poured out the Holy Spirit into his church to all who believe that God himself is present with us and he's given us authority to cast out devils and to heal the sick. And he says in the end of Mark's gospel that we'll do even greater things than him. And I've seen people literally get physically healed at this church when I prayed very not a lot of faith kind of prayers. I mean, one of my good friends, his daughter was going to have to have her skull— she's two years old— was going to have to have her skull opened up to make room for her brain, and it was going to be a terrible surgery. And I just stood outside those two doors, and I just put my hand on Rachel, and I said, God, please heal Rachel. In Jesus' name, amen. And Seth and Seth Rodriguez were like, thank you. And we all walked away perfectly faithlessly from that moment, right? And then they went to the doctor, and she was better and didn't have to have this terrible surgery. Like, and I can tell you multiple stories about that. I can also tell you stories about people healed from years of crippling disability who then got up and departed from the Lord in their new state of prosperous health to their own perdition. So don't think healing's the answer. It's not the answer. But it's present, but it's not— it's shrouded. Why does that person get healed and not— Like, Mike Bersford, it's a great example. Executive pastor of our church— lives in chronic pain his whole life. He has put his hands on people, and they've got up and walked. He's, he has prayed for people, seen them healed. He's seen amazing—I mean, he said this today, we were praying for him in, in prayer meeting. He's like, he's like, Nick, I mean, I've seen people just get healed. I've put my hands on people and felt the Spirit move through me and heal their bodies. And people have been praying for me for, you know, 25 years, and I'm not healed. There is a shroud, an annoying, frustrating, angry, anger-creating, disillusioning— shroud between the glory and what we want. And it may be that God isn't glorious. It may be that it is for our good that he doesn't give us what we want all the time. Amen. Right? Now, we should be really glad for this. In all of the ways in which God disappoints and angers us, we should be so glad. Because the reason we're angry is because we're wrong— and our expectations are wrong, and our character is malformed, and we don't trust God, who is beautifully good. And so we're upset, and God's like, I'm not playing your game, and that is good news. It is beautiful news. Because he's not going to make devils out of us. He's not going to make brats out of us. He's making redeemed divine image bearers full of glory out of us. Right? Right? So one of the things that we should see is is that God's shrouded glory is itself a revelation of him. The way he does and doesn't reveal himself, the way he doesn't, does and doesn't show himself, the way he does and doesn't speak is itself a revelation. Like if you know somebody, what they do and what they don't do in the mixture of those two tells you more about them than just what they do or just what they don't do. What they do, what they don't do, and when they do and don't do it, and relative to whom they do and don't do it. Like, so, like, I've had very helpful friends that always want to help people, and then there's somebody they just won't help. Why not that person? And they're like, well, there's a certain thing that they do, and I just, I can't enable that. And what's loving towards that person is for me not to help them. And you're like, oh, you're deeper than I thought you were. I thought you just were a a people pleaser. You know, I wasn't sure, but now I know, you know. 
Well, one of the ways to think about this is this. So this is what I'm going to talk about the rest of the sermon, is that God makes his goodness the means of his glory. God makes his goodness the means of his glory. We don't like that. But it's absolutely necessary for our redemption. It's absolutely necessary for us to ever be wielders of power. And it's absolutely necessary for us to ever experience glory in ourselves. And it says in Ephesians 3 that the purpose of all that God is doing in all this, these mysterious ways is ultimately including our sufferings, the apostle says, is for your glory. So let's, I want to look, um, I want to try to flow through the logic of this a little bit. Now, I want you to understand I'm massively oversimplifying this, and I'm only going to follow one line of logic for why God shrouds his glory. There may be a hundred, there may be 10,000. God is always doing more than you think. He's always working more angles than you've ever imagined. He always sees more variables than we've ever considered. So when I, what I'm saying is not in any sense exhaustive for why God shrouds his glory the way he is. I'm just following one line of logic in the Bible that I think is relatively central that can hopefully relieve for us our anger and give us space to trust God. And if we can trust God, even if we don't know the whole story, that's enough. Because if you trust God, he will guide you and teach you more, and you'll grow into wisdom. And you may then, 10 years from now, understand 50 reasons why God shrouds his glory. Whereas today, this may, you may just take on your first. Does that make sense? So it's important to remember that if God loves us, that his way of showing and shrouding his glory is relative to our condition, what we're really like. God doesn't just make his choices philosophically based on his ideologies. He makes his choices psychologically based on the needs of the human beings he's actually trying to help. Does that make sense? And so if you're like, well, this, the logic of this thing God does doesn't make sense. It never will because he's trying to redeem creatures that don't make sense. And as long as he's trying to redeem you and I, He's going to be an actor relative to how we behave, think, and act, which means he's never going to seem sane because he's literally dealing with people who are insane. Okay. Um, so there's four steps in this. The first step is God the revelator relates to us the truth suppressors, right? Like if we think, well, why is God's glory shrouded? Well, it may be that God isn't the definitive glory shrouder. In, in, the book of, um, in the book of Psalms, God says, says this through the psalmist in Psalm, 9, Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where he, their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. Verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart, and so on. He's saying two things. God's creation is filled with his natural and special revelation. And his revelation in creation, by means of math and science and things that are humanly discoverable in the process of taking dominion of creation, are not linguistically focused. It's not like they're in English or Spanish or Malayalam, right? Anybody in any language, in any tribe, in any people, at any level of education, in any level of human development can see the glory of God if they're willing to see it. He says that they pour forth speech. It's not like a couple of sentences or like, hey, I'm here. It says that they are constantly pouring forth talking about the glory of God. Amen. And so if we don't think that God is revealed, what Psalm 19 is saying is that we're not listening, right? And then there's God's special revelation. So there's the glory of creation, and there is the divine image bearing of human beings that are part of his natural revelation, including more like human conscience and so on. But there's also his special revelations, how he has acted in history with the Jewish people, how he has revealed himself in his written word, and how he has come in the man Jesus Christ, and how he has poured out his spirit and given signs and wonders and direction through, through gifts of the spirit by which to reveal himself specially to human beings. And these two are combined to create a massive revelation of God that is fully consistent with insufficient for our needs. That's God's first point. That the idea that God's glory is shrouded, that we can't know him, that we don't have utterly sufficient revelation to know him is in fact false. And the reason why we experience it as false, why we feel like it's false, is because we, in the state that we're in right now, are truth suppressors. 
Do you look at Romans chapter 1 in this book of, of consummate good news? It has to start out with why God behaves the way he does, and he starts out with how we behave. And it says this. He's talking about the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is from first to last, just as, as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And you're like, why is that the whole message? Why is the most important thing that God has revealed a righteousness? What I want is a power. I want power and glory. I want to win. I want success. I want, I want money. I want health. I want things to go well. I want my enemies to leave me alone. I want liberation is what I want. Why are you so fixated, Paul, on a righteousness being revealed? I'm already fine. I don't need to be. I'm already good enough. What do you, who's anybody to judge me, right? And, and it, well, read the next verse. It says in verse 18, he says, The wrath of God is being revealed against, from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who, this is a key phrase, suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. How is that so? Verse 20, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him nor gave thanks to Him, but in their thinking, their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Though they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. You see the idea there? He's saying, um, we knew God in our souls through the capacity humans have in, in the nature being made in the image of God and in the capacity of human conscience in, in what that creates inside of us and in the creation that pours forth speech. And the reason we don't know God, even though we do know God, is because we don't want to. That is, we he says we suppress the truth in our—what's the word? Wickedness. That is, we don't want to know the truth for moral reasons. That's the claim of the Scriptures. That the fundamental problem with human beings is a moral problem, and that creates, to, for you who are philosophers, epistemic problems, right? How do we know things, right? The, the question of, do we know God exists? That's epistemology. How do you know stuff? Is predicated on the moral problem. You see, we don't believe that. We believe we're good people. And so we think the question is just like, well, why does God reveal himself more? Because if he did, I'd know more and I'd see him. And the answer is, that's not what God says. What God says is that there's a lot of truths that are incredibly plain, and we actually don't want to know them. And because we don't want to know them, we suppress them. And when we suppress them, that has an epistemic effect, right? It actually changes how we know things in a negative way so that we have even less of an ability to know them because we become more committed to things that aren't true. And so our foolish hearts are no longer just foolish. They become darkened. And by claiming to be wise in that state of foolishness, we actually become fools, right? That's— that's where we are. That's the baseline. And now, now the question is, if that's the baseline, then, then what does God do next? And the answer is, is that God displays his glory in a way intended to be healing to such creatures like us. So if we're Romans 1 kind of creatures, or Romans 2, that except in religious self-righteousness, how does God relate to us, right? Does he just show his glory? Boom! Because that's not what he does in the scriptures, is it? So you can look at it this way. That God choose to press, he choose to press in his glorious goodness to the human race while humans are addicted to and corrupted by glory and power, right? Um, man, I hate to bring Tolkien into every sermon, right? But this is what the Lord of the Rings is all about, right? That the goodness of the world rise or falls on the humble actions of insignificant people who choose against all odds and courage to do the good, the hobbit, right? Utterly powerless, not special, not sophisticated, but willing in humility to do the good, and in so doing saves the world. Me meanwhile, the great are so focused on who has power and who doesn't have power that they seek enough power to win and so get corrupted and are then used by evil to destroy good. Because as Tolkien said, all men seek power, which came from his experience of World War I and trench warfare and the way countries and their desire for power were willing to wipe out whole generations of their young men, right? Power has an extremely bad track record of transforming people for the good. 
So if your, if your interest is to transform human beings for the good and to save them, displaying your power and giving them power, Andre, is not a great track record, right? So think about this, the Exodus. God inflicts 10 plagues on the people of Egypt, parts the Red Sea for the Jews to leave. What is the moral effect that has on the Egyptian people and Pharaoh himself? It's not good. It's not good. They don't learn, right? What, but what's its moral effect on the Jewish people who leave through the parted Red Sea? It's not good. <laughs> I mean, this is— the parting of the Red Sea, other than perhaps the resurrection of the Christ, is the greatest miracle in the history of planet Earth. If there's any display of power that you would think would be inherently transformative to a human being who experienced it, it would be a person who was utterly in slavery. There were 10 enormous plagues. God acted incredibly. You literally walked through a split ocean. Got to the other side, saw an army chasing you through that split ocean that you had no capacity to fight. That ocean then swallows them up. And then there is a burning pillar of fire in front of you leading you on. You would think if, like, if any display of the power of God had any capacity to by power morally change the human heart, that would do it. And it didn't do it. The fall of Jericho. People steal plunder. Right? You, the conquest. At the m moment it's over, God gives them the power to take the land. The moment it's over, everybody does what's right in their own eyes. He gives them a series of judges, these people who rise up and, in power and strength, deliver the people of Israel. And the moment the judge is gone, they go right back to doing whatever they want to, seeking their own glory, their own power, their own prosperity, their own victories. And then there's the whole history of the kings, and on and on it goes. Right? Power, the display of glory, the display of power, does not change anything. It doesn't make men and women good. It doesn't transform. It doesn't create real faith. When people come to God on the basis of power, they come for all the wrong reasons, they come for, for all the wrong things, and they become all the wrong sorts of creatures. And power doesn't really transform people towards faith. Like in, in Luke chapter 16, there's this passage where there's the poor man Lazarus, and there's this rich man in the house, and, and they don't interact, and they both die. And Lazarus goes to Abraham's bosom, which is like a pre-heaven paradise, and the rich man goes to, to torment, and he's in torment. And he says to Abraham, he says, Abraham, um, he said, if I can't be saved now— Send Lazarus back to my five brothers to tell them about the torment that I'm in. If somebody rises from the dead and tells them about their brother being hell and knows stuff they couldn't otherwise know and, and confronts them with it as an apparition, they'll believe and they'll be saved and they'll, they'll be averted from this penalty. You know what Abraham says to him? He says, listen, they have Moses and the prophets. And if they won't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't believe even if somebody comes back from the dead. Now that's crazy. Right? I mean, that's one of Jesus' parables where most people read that, and they're like, that's bull. Because if I, I'm reading the Bible right now, and it's not that interesting, and if, I, if somebody, like, appeared from the dead and told me something, that would be much more impactful. And it would be for about a couple weeks. Like, for, for this amount of time, as long as you, like, you, you glandularly, emotionally remember it, it'll, it'll affect you. But I mean, how many times have people been like, like in the—this is why the foxhole prayer doesn't work. God, if you get me out of this thing, I'll, I'll serve you forever. Forever meaning about— 76 hours, right? The reason why foxhole prayers don't convert people is not because they're not converted at that moment. It's that they were converted out of all the wrong reasons for all the wrong purposes to all the wrong image of God in their mind. And so, of course, they left God immediately after that, the moment the bullets weren't flying over their head. That's the, one of the reasons why some people, when they get saved by God healing-wise, when God heals them physically— it actually moves them towards perdition rather than salvation because they didn't come to God for the sign of his love, which is the fir first fruits of his eternal life and final glory. They came to God because they wanted to feel better so they could do stuff. And that meant more to them than the sign of the love of God and his compassion for humanity revealed in his Christ, wrought by his Spirit, to be completely fulfilled in eternity. Right? And so if God were to try to transform us with his power, with his glory, we'd come for the wrong reasons. We'd be transformed in all the wrong ways. His glory would transform us into devils. And that's not his eternal purpose. Right? 
power will motivate us to repulsive and lopsided faith. It will corrupt us in the condition that we're currently in, and it won't give us the school of humility, which is, which is the school we actually need. The school of suffering and pain, which can lead to humility, is what we need, because here's the thing. You know what God's ultimate plan for you is? His ultimate eternal plan for you is power and glory. Redeemed saints will be, in the end, more powerful than you've ever imagined and more glorious than you've ever imagined. You will bear power and glory. And here's the thing. Um, Name a human being you know of that has received power and glory in this earth in temporal means that it didn't destroy. You're not ready. We're not ready. Some of us have to bear some of it. But it's really hard. Very few people can bear it. I, it, Abraham Lincoln said that one time. He's like, listen, um, there are lots of men who are good enough in character to bear, har- to bear hardship, but I would wager not one in a million so good that they can bear power. God's power and glory revealed is not the school we need to be prepared for the power and glory that he will give us. Last, uh, or third is the step of grace. So the way God decides to act is to press in his goodness by freely giving human beings what they need to receive it as a gift and to throw themselves on mercy. So as to become humble and merciful creatures that can grow in wisdom through humility so that ultimately they would be morally prepared to bear power. Right? So God acts to fit us for glory freely through grace— And human beings seek to trade and sacrifice for power, which is both idolatry and legalism. So idolatry is to make up an image of God and act like you can trade something for something else. If I give you this, God, then you need to give me back this. Or legalism, God, I see these rules you've given me. I'm going to obey them, and then you're going to like that, and you're going to give me stuff. And so therefore, there's this dynamic, either whether it's religious legalism or whether it's a kind of like spiritual, spirituality kind of like idolatry where you make up your own God. Either way, it's running on the same principle. I'm going to do work and sacrifice for God. God's going to give me what I want, and I'll have the glory and power that I need. And God's like, I don't work like that at all. I will not work like that. I do not play that game. You can't pull me into that. I will not respond to it. I'm going to give you a gracious offer of a free gift of that which is beyond what you could ever dream of, but it's going to look very humble in the gift itself. In fact, it's going to feel like there's no gift at all. And you have to give up your claim to glory and power and victory and prestige. And in that humility and suffering, you will be fitted for and prepared for through faith and redemption and the work of the Spirit for the glory and power and love and hope and pleasure that I will ultimately give you. A good example of this is in um, the book of John in chapter 6. Jesus does all these miracles, gives people what they need healing-wise. And then he— um, they're, they're, they're kind of in a, a remote area, and so then he feeds them miraculously. He takes these loaves and fish, and he prays over them, and he feeds everybody with them. So all 5,000 people and everybody who's with them, because it's 5,000 men, but it's all the other people too, um, all eat and are filled. And then they want to make Jesus king by force. Why? Well, because they think, oh, he's the prophet. Like Moses. Moses gave us man in the desert. He gave us food for 40 years in the desert, right? And remember, in the ancient world, people labored about 80% of their work hours for food right? So imagine somebody who would give you food for free so he can heal you, he can feed you, and he's going to beat the Romans and liberate you. This is the guy we want, so they're going to make him king by force. And you know what he does? I want you to listen to this right now. This is very important. Do you know that Jesus did one of the most amazing miracles in the Bible to get away from people? It says in John's gospel that Jesus doesn't get in the boat with the disciples. They— go across, and then he hides out for a while, and then he walks on the Sea of Galilee. He walks on water to do what? Now, he does some other stuff to build his disciples' faith that we hear about in Mark and Matthew's gospel, but in John's gospel, he is just getting away from the people who want to make him king, who want nothing more from him but for him to give them glory and power and success and wealth. And he's like, no! And he does one of the greatest miracles in the Bible, perhaps the greatest besides raising people from the dead, walking on water to get away from humans that just want him to give them glory, power, success, food. He leaves them miraculously. And then they find him. And when they catch up with him, they say, they say, uh, uh, um, master, teacher, when did, when did you get here to Capernaum? Because they're now all the way to the other side of the lake. And he says this. He says, I tell you the truth. You're looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate your lo- the loaves and had your fill. You know why you came to find me? It wasn't because when I did the miracle, you saw what that meant. 
You didn't see it as a sign. You didn't say, oh my gosh, this is God's Messiah. We should listen to him. He said, the reason you've come to find me is because your bellies were full. That's all you care about. And so you've come to me to fill your belly again. And that's not why I'm here. I filled your belly miraculously, and I healed your sick miraculously so you could see who I am, so that you would listen to me, and I could give you the gift I came to give you. Which is, he said, he says, now, don't work for— remember the trade thing I just said? Don't work for bread that rots! He says later in the chapter, he said, your forefathers, they got manna in the desert. Moses gave them manna. And you know what what happened to them after they ate manna for 40 years? They died. Like everybody else. He said, I've come to give you the bread of life, which will give you eternal life. And they don't get it. They don't get it anywhere in the chapter. They're like, well, if you're the prophet, shouldn't you give us manna? He's like, I'll give you the bread of heaven. They're like, sir, give this to us for the rest of our lives, basically. From now on, give this to us. He's like, you don't get it. I'm the bread of life. And they're like, I don't see how you can be the bread of life because we know Mary, you know, and like, how could you have come down from heaven? You know, and he's like, you don't understand it. Finally, this is when he says the creepiest thing in the Bible. So he uses one of the greatest miracles to get away from me, these people. And then he utters the creepiest sentence in the Bible to help them get it. He's like, listen, if you don't eat my flesh— and drink my blood, you can have no part of me. And he says it like four, three or four times. Listen, let, my, my flesh is real food. My blood is real drink. I'm going to give you my flesh to eat. And if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part with me. And see, here's the, here's the issue with that. Why does he say that? That's crazy, right? Like Jews don't believe in cannibalism. That's not what he means. Like why would he say, why would he intentionally tank his entire ministry? Why would he make everybody, because that's what happens. Everybody leaves after that. The only people who stay are the apostles. Even most of his disciples leave. Why? Here's why, I think. Because when somebody makes a statement like that, you either trust the statement or the person. You have to choose. When somebody says something totally crazy, you either go, okay, listen, I'm going to go with my own instincts on this. You're nuts. And I'm out of here. Right? Or you have to say, I'm, I'm hearing you. That sounds crazy. I did just watch you heal people's leprosy and paralysis and blindness and their inability to speak and their mental illness. I just watched that for like four days. And then I watched you feed 12,000 people with a few loaves of bread and a couple of little fish. And so that sounds crazy, but frankly, I'm curious. And so I'm going to stick around long enough to find out what the heck that means. And that's what Peter does. He's like, Jesus is like, are you going to leave? He's like, Peter's like, I don't know where we would go. You have the words of eternal life. Now, John does not record whether or not Peter said. Now, that last thing you said was a little nuts. (laughs) But we've, I've been with you and I trust you and I know that means something. And I'm willing to stick around until I know what it means. Right? You see, Jesus is saying, you have to trust and believe in me. Right? Pascal said it this way. There's enough light for those who desire to see and enough obscurity for those who have a contrary disposition. Right? I'm going to end here. But let me say it this way while the worship band gets ready to come here. Um, God has dynamically ordered his shroudedness and his revelation of himself for us. For what we really need, what we actually require. There is plenty of revelation plenty of help, plenty of healing, plenty of hope, plenty of giving, plenty of generosity for us to see his character. Not to win in this life, but for us to know who it is we're trusting if we choose to trust him. And he's laid before us an incredible um, confrontation where he's like, listen, you guys, if you're going to be healed, I can't play your game because your problem is in your head and in your heart. And if I play your game, you'll never be healed. And I will not give you eternal life that includes your glorification if you refuse to be fitted to be the kind of person who can bear glory and power well. And as, and if we do trust him now, not only will he transform us so that we can bear glory and power well in the life to come, which is his main goal, but the auxiliary benefit is, is that you'll actually be fitted to live your own life. Whatever power or glory or authority that you're given, you will be a sacrificial, merciful, yet authoritative and godly 
leader in whatever sense that is. Does that make sense? But he will not play this another way. He will not give his glory in a way that brands for our worldliness and our sinfulness. He will not submit to our tastes, and he will not oversimplify himself for our little minds. We must expand to wisdom, and we must expand our hearts to faith and trust him. Because he's shown at every step where he displays his glory that he's trustworthy. And he's also shown at every step, step where he's shrouded his glory to do it for our good and our salvation, which demonstrates that he's trustworthy. And where was that more beautifully displayed than in the man Jesus Christ himself, in which there was glory that was shrouded, that was revealed, that was hidden, that was crucified and buried in humiliating weakness, and that rose from the dead in glorious strength. We're meant to follow him in the present, and we're meant to have his eternal end as ours. It is good news. It is the best news you have ever heard that God does not reveal his power and glory like you want him to. If you trust him, he will teach you a hundred miles of wisdom of why he does that. And in every step, he will be fitting you in his goodness through transforming faith to prepare you for a glorious eternity. Because he's not just interested in his glory, he says in Ephesians. The mystery of his glory is that all of it is for your glory. God, as we pray and look to you, please help us to be joyful that you don't brand. You don't simplify. You don't play to our tastes. And it's all for our good. It's all for our glory. It's all out of love. Help us to believe in all the ways you display yourself at healing and in speaking and in the written scriptures and in creation and to receive, to not be glory suppressors, but to be glory receivers. Help us to see it and be able to describe it and help other people see it and help us to embrace and enjoy and believe in the ways that you shroud your glory to accept the path of suffering and to grow in the school of humility so that we could have the wisdom of Christ unconformed to this world and transformed by the renewing of our mind, keeping in step with the Spirit and being people so virtuous in it that we can act free to live sacrificially in love for others. We pray in Jesus' name that you would fit us for glory. Amen. Hey, everybody. I'm Erin Hesse, and I oversee the Connections and Small Groups Department here at High Point, and I'm glad to host Amy this morning. So, hey. we've got a few questions. Um, if you're still thinking about something, you, want, you have a question, whether you are here in person or if you're watching online, you can still text in to 608-836-3236 any questions that come up even in the next couple minutes. Yeah, so. and it might get in because there's, there's space. Yes, yeah. So, Nick, first question. Why did you think it was important to follow this particular line of logic you presented as to why God shrouds his glory as compared to any other lines of logic that would reach the same conclusion? Um, here's what the answer is always. That monitor back there and how long you will sit here and listen. That's it. That's the only reason. Um, there's, I mean, there's just so much more. I would love to do 30 hours on this, and, and we easily could. Um, and a lot of the lines of logic interweave with each other. So they're not like literally all separate. Nothing's separate with God. Everything is all woven together in this tapestry of glory. And so I just teased this one out because I had like 35 or 40 minutes. And so I picked this one because I thought I could make it clear enough. And I was preaching to the youth on John 6 anyway. And I was like, oh, that works. And I'm trying to save time. And I only have so much time in my life. So it's all practical reasons like that. Great. Mm -hmm. All right. Secondly, if God doesn't heal us, if it would corrupt us, why are there some people who were healed and left because of the healing? Yeah. Okay. So one of the, one of the paradoxes that is not going to be in this series is the paradox of providence and responsibility. Um, how God providentially rules over all things, and yet still um, we operate freely within that providence, and we are responsible for what we do. So there are, there are numerous cases in which God knows certain ends, and um, he still treats us in our best opportunity for a good end. So, so God, even if we—he knows we'll never act in good faith, he still always acts in good faith because that is the most gracious thing to do. It's also the most condemning thing to do, right? Because the more God acts in good—so, you know, like, if we get in an argument, and, and let's say we'll make you the good person, and so I'm arguing with you, and I'm—like, I start being kind of mean, and you are mean back, right? And we fight. That's not as damning of me than if you don't fight back. 
and you're just kind. You're just like, well, I see you're getting heated, but here's what I'm trying to say, and like, you're just really nice. You're trying to act in good faith so that I will go, oh, I'm being a jerk. I'm sorry, right? But even if you are pretty sure, because I never do back down, you're still going to do that because it's the right thing. And you gave me my best chance. I just rejected it, right? God always acts for our good. He always acts in good faith towards us. Even if he's 100% sure, we are not going to act back in good faith. And in some cases, healing someone is their best route. It is the most in good faith action to them. And yet they still squander it and choose not to follow it. But God is always acting in good faith. But the reality is God is acting in good faith towards everybody who disbelieves in him. This is just one way he acts in good faith towards them and they disbelieve. But there are many others. Right. Like receiving sunlight and rain and food and breath and life. Those are always God acts in good faith towards us and a thousand other redemptive things and not killing us this moment in all of these ways. And yet most of us just were oblivious, you know. Taking a step back to do some defining. Can you define for us glory? What is it? Um, Glory is, in a sense, the culmination of the magnificence of God. Magnificence then can break down into multiple, like, areas. So God is magnificent in his being. He's infinite. He's, he has all the attributes of infinity, omnipresence, omnipotence, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, He is also perfect or magnificent in his moral capacities. That is his goodness, right? And he's also magnificent in his, in his behaviors toward us. He's relationally magnificent, right? And what God is seeking to press in in the plan of salvation is the latter two, right? While still revealing something of the first. And so um, it's kind of like holiness takes in multiple things, separateness, moral purity, and, and so on. Um, glo- glory is everything that's true and good about God to the extent to which it exists, which is infinitely. And to get some kind of apprehension of its, of its grandeur and also its complexity, simultaneously operating in a way that basic, that creates a transcendent experience for yourself, where you're like, you get beyond your own self-centeredness, and you're like, that's real. This isn't, as much as that is. And this needs to conform to that, not the other way around. That experience is the experience of faith that happens when you encounter God's glory. So it, yeah, God, it's very sad that God's glory is— God's, I mean, so many Christian words we parrot and mm-hmm. don't see right. or taste or feel. Uh, Jonathan Edwards used to talk about it, about God making us sensible of something. That like, we would so apprehend it emotionally and intellectually that we would, that our senses would actually come alive, that we would feel joy, that we could like, that it would be such a strong truth that it would get even into our body and activate our nervous system around it, you know? And th- that has to happen. And that needs to happen in your vision of God's glory. Um, and, and so you should be—that's why we worship. That's, there's many ways in which we're pursuing increasing apprehension and sensibility of God's glory. That's good. That's helpful. Thank you. All right, so someone said, I feel like you undersold foxhole prayers. Some people do meaningfully come to faith that way. Granted, many don't. Um, the example that he gave is the guy who converted um, Vasily Barbiero— who it's close you, enough. Yes. Okay, great. Who you interviewed on the podcast. There's clearly an important role for the miraculous in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Mm-hmm. So does God use what he says is whiz bang glory to save those who are receptive to it but withhold it from the generic public? Yeah, so one of the things that 1 Corinthians 12 says is that God the Holy Spirit operates on his own providence. So God can give you a gift and not give me a gift, right? And that's, that's based on his own intelligence, belief, and what he wants to do, right? And so God is utterly free in that. And, and that's one of the things you and I have to accept, or we'll, our hearts will be eaten out by envy, right? And jealousy. So that's how he operates. Now, it is true that in many cases, God will respond to foxhole-type prayers in good faith. And the, the one here, there, um, I, I forget if it was Vasily's father-in-law, what? but it was like a generation older than him. So this is under um, communism, but I think the per- guy was in a Nazi— prisoner of war camp, and he decided to escape. And he ran through the woods, and he, and he ended up in this open field. They're coming after him with dogs, and there's this, like, 
group of trees in the middle of the field, and he gets out, and he's in this group of trees, which, like, you could basically see through. Like, there's no way you can hide from German shepherds in this, and they've got, like, three of them. And he said to the guy, prayed to God and asked for him to protect him and make him unseen. And these German shepherds, like, went around, like, three times, and then they just left. And he was converted, and he, like, believed in Jesus, and he got saved, and that is now multi-generational faith in that family. And the answer to this question is yes. Um, what I used, it was rhetorical hyperbole. Uh, I was underselling foxhole conversions. God does do miraculous momentary things when people cry out because they're at the, the end of their rope. And um, he uses that, even if they're not totally sincere at that moment, to create a path of sincerity for them, and he really does save them. That totally happens. So like, if you're in a foxhole, don't be like, well, Pastor Nick said it's no use foxhole praying. <laughs> like— Pray foxhole prayers. And, but when God answers it, don't find him the next day because your belly was filled. Find him the next day because you saw the sign, believed in its meaning, and you turned to his love. That's good. All right, another question came in. We have seen so many examples in evangelicalism of those with power being corrupted. If we are in a place of earthly power in our work, ministry, or whatever— what are some safeguards or strategies that we can implement to prevent us from being corrupted by this? Oh, gosh. Yeah, that is not a 90-second question. Um, one of the things that um, Mike Beresford and I talk about a lot is the balance between the distribution of power, which slows things down, and the consolidation of power that speeds things up. Right? So one of the reasons why there's so much of a problem in evangelicalism is because we get very talented— usually men, who are leading churches, and they make good decisions, and they're busting forward, and they can stand up to the world, and we love it. They're like this fighting figure. And we say, you're winning. We trust you. And we just get behind those people, and we also work them to death. We let them work to death for us. And so what happens is, is that they are in an unhealthy context with the corrupting realities of power, with it undispersed, where there's nobody who can tell them the truth and get in their face. And so like at High Point Church, for example, we have, we have 12 people, 12 to 13 people on our elder board, and the elder board can just—they can, can tell me what to do in a lot of areas. And like, there's all kinds of ideas Mike and I have that we have to take through the elder board and come up with this plan and then work with the blah, blah, blahs and do the such and such and so-and-sos. And, um, you know, Mike's from a, like a charismatic tradition where you just—the pastor just does things, you know? But that's also how our church went from 1,000 people to about 275, because we had a couple pastors that just did things. And it, it was corrupting to them, and it was dividing of the congregation, and it was dividing of the body of Christ. So, um, so like in my life, I have two elders that meet with me. I have like, I mean, I have software on all my screens. Like I'm a sex addict, though I've, I've, I can't remember the last time I saw pornography in my whole life. Like I treat, my, I, I try to, and I tell people like, listen, I say in my sermons, I like, listen, the day is going to come. I hope it never comes when I'm going to be the bad guy, and you're going to have to do X, right? Like, um, but I— we function our church in con this form of congregational with the dispersion of power. It is so annoying. Like, the, the problem is, is what, what happens is we grow impatient with two things. I'll try to do this quick. Sorry. We grow impatient with two things. One, the division of power slows things down. And we want to win. And we live in a culture that's, like, not super excited about historical, biblical Christian faith. And so we, we don't want anything to slow down any of our power. We want to, like, utilize all of our resources. The problem is, is that if we do that, we consolidate power enough— that we have streamlined leadership, we don't have accountability and dispersed power, right? Um, the second problem is, is that um, the reason why dispersed power doesn't work is because it uses democratic principles. That is, all of us have to be leaders, and none of us want to be, right? Like, one of the reasons why democracy doesn't work is because democracy can only work in a virtuous society where people don't vote their interests, but they vote the interest of the, of the status of the nation itself, right? Now, 28 to 30 trillion in debt ought to show us that we as Americans don't do that, right? Um, you know, we can spend 30 trillion dollars on ourselves. We can't spend another 200 billion over 10 years to not have women get beheaded in, in Afghanistan. You understand? This is, this is how democracy works when the public doesn't say, I, each one of us has to vote, not my interests, but I have to vote the dictates of virtue and all of us together trying to understand the dictates of virtue into the democratic process as though I was a leader myself, then delegating that responsibility to the person who I then elect is how this must function. That's not what we do. We all vote our pocketbooks and try to get your money transferred to me and my money transferred to you. 
And when we do that, we destroy the fabric of mutual accountability. We all become mutual thieves. When we become mutual thieves, the dispersion of power doesn't stop power from being bad. It actually makes it worse. Because then you build warring coalitions that try to slit each other's throat to get what gold they hold. So the dispersion of power doesn't save us. It just brings more people into the play. It's why if Israel had a great king, Israel did great. And the minute Israel had a bad king, it did bad. Because when you have a king, you're doing as well as the king. In a democracy, you're doing as well as the polis, the group of people. Right? You're doing as well as they are virtuous. So we can disperse power into 13 elders, but we we have to have three 13 godly men to elect. And those men have to be virtuous enough to do what's right, live by mercy, and stand up to me. And that's not super easy. I mean, they could take lessons from my wife, but it's hard. (laughs) You understand? And so, like, we won't grow up. We won't be virtuous enough to do it. And so either we'll let somebody like me burn myself to death in flames in front of you for 15 years until you, you catch me with some woman and be like, well, he was good for a while. That was a good run. He really betrayed us right? Or we all have to be virtuous, do the ministry of the church together, all sacrificing for each other and serving one another so we all live sustainable lives so that my accountability partners can also support me, right? And I'll tell you that this church is better than any church I've been a part of in that. Um, the, the, the volunteers, the, yeah, the volunteers of this church are amazing. You guys do pitch in, and I, but I, I still want to preach to the choir, Okay? We still need to keep, we need to, like, everybody wants to sing one line, we need to keep singing four-part harmony. Like, we need to all be part of the work of the church, and you want the elder board not just, like, holding me accountable, but supporting me, which it does. And so that relationship of support and accountability, people that can speak the truth to whoever's in leadership, but also in our congregational meetings, people aren't fighting for their little thing. I've never seen in our church, I've never seen a congregational meeting where somebody got up and they fought for their department. I've never seen it. I haven't even seen it, and I don't even think I've really seen it in a staff meeting. Where like Erin got up, she's like, my department doesn't have enough money, and nobody cares about us. And we're, she's always like, listen, I don't feel like Nicole has what she needs. We need to support her. I've never seen it at an elder board meeting. Where, I mean, every once in a while, Frank has to fight for the school because we forget about the school. So sometimes Frank's like, look, y'all, forget about the school, which that needs to be done. And we're like, you're right, we forgot about the school. But that doesn't happen. But listen, this is only, it only continues by vigilance. We have to serve one another. We have to fight for one another. We have to hold each other accountable. And we have to support one another. Because I know, I know what happened to those men. Because I've been, I've been close enough. And um, what happened to those men is not strange. It's not unpredictable. It's not, um, I mean, just read the Bible. <laughs> right? And so um, we can have leaders that do well, um, but it is, it is, it's not a miracle. It is a triumph for a leader to live a whole life in ministry well, and they don't do it alone. They do it with a great family of people around them, which I have been experiencing, and it's still been hard for me. Does that make sense? So I don't know, there's so many pieces to that, um, but I guess I just need to stop where I'm over too far. So. That's right. That's, it's good to have those reminders um, and yeah, I think you us. were supposed to tell me to shut my mouth because we went too long. But it's okay. I, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so whether you are with us here in person or watching with us online, we have people that would love to pray for you. If there's something that you feel you need to confess, if there is something you are grieved over, if the sermon pricked your heart in some way, and you're not even really sure what you need prayer for, there are people to pray. So both online and in person. Um, over this way for in person, and then online there should be a button that comes up for you. So Mm -hmm. will you close us in prayer? Yeah. Um, Lord bless Gwen and all the people in children's ministry. We love them. Help them to not see the anger at me. Um, We pray that you would help us to be so glad that you're not brandable, so glad that you're not reducible, simplifiable, and that you don't play to our tastes, but you transform and heal them. Please help us to receive that by faith, to really believe it deeper than we ever have, and to turn to you in real faith so that you can build wisdom in us, so that you can grow godliness in us, so that you can grow holiness in us, and so that you can fit us to be able to bear whatever power is put in our hands like faithful stewards. And so that we can recognize that you have done all these glorious things for our glory, so that we could basically experience your glory. And we pray that you would fit us for this such happiness. In Jesus' name, amen.